following program is an original presentation of Shalom TV. On May 14, 1948, David Ben-Gurion rose in a crowded Tel Aviv museum and read the Declaration of Independence of the Modern State of Israel. By virtue of the natural and historic right of the Jewish people and of the resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations, we hereby proclaim the establishment of the Jewish state in Palestine to be called Medinat Yisrael, the state of Israel. It was the first time Jews had sovereignty in the land of Israel since the days of the Maccabees, almost two centuries BCE. The day after David Ben-Gurion read the Declaration of Independence, Arab nations from virtually every direction invaded the infant state, intent on destroying it before it ever had a chance to breathe real life. A remarkable group of human beings, individuals, men and women, they tended to be young, took arms against an Arab invasion and in a harrowing conflict established the modern state of Israel by force of arms. Whenever the people of Israel, the Jewish people worldwide, celebrate the anniversary of the State of Israel, Yom Ha'atzma'ut, Israel Independence Day. It is important to remember that it was not only a day of joy, it was a day of anxiety because it led to what in essence remains the War of Independence. On this program, I have the honor, a real honor, of speaking with one of the individuals who fought in the War of Independence in 1948. He was 18 years old on May 14, 1948. He had been in Israel some three years. He'd immigrated there in 1945 to do all he could to pave the way for the establishment of the State of Israel. And we know the names Yitzhak Rabin and Yigal Alon and then Moshe Dayan, Ezer Weitzman, to be sure, amazing, wonderful heroes, not only of the State of Israel, but of Jewish history. But while they're the names we know, it's the Joe Abudis whose names all of us should revere because they were the individuals who, day by day, step by step, fought to make sure there was a Jewish homeland for the Jewish people. It is my great honor to welcome Joseph Abudi, who in 1948, at 18 years old, helped to fight the War of Independence and create the modern state of Israel. Joe Abudi, it is an honor for me to meet you. It is, by the way, I, we've already spoken. You're a lovely human being. Thank you. But understand that I am speaking on behalf of every Jew watching right now. We owe you an enormous debt of gratitude. We thank you for what you've done, and it is so kind of you to come by and spend a few moments recalling, if you would, the events leading up to and then the events that surrounded your participation in Israel's War of Independence. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. So first of all, can we talk about you leading up to 48? You are from Syria. Yes, sir. In fact, we have a gorgeous picture of your entire family, your mother and father. And how many siblings do we have here? We uh, have uh, a, a three sisters and a brother. And you're on the far right of this picture. Right. And your mother and father's names? Uh, Sophie and Hillel. Sophie and Hillel. Okay. So you grew up as a Jew in Syria? Yes. By the way, in general, we're talking here of the 30s and 40s. Was life good for the Jews of Syria in the 30s and 40s? Yes, the, the, the uh, Syria was under the French uh, uh, 
uh, mandate, colony mandate right. and the time was very good but actually in Syria for thousands of years from time to time they were just a little bit uh, uh, pogrom or something like that but not really bad the Jews had very good uh, life in Syria were there blood libels against Jews in Syria uh, after the dec declaration of the United Nations uh, the state of Israel after 47 48, 47, 48. yes now, you're growing up a youngster. In fact, you were in the Jewish Boy Scouts yes. in Syria. Here we have a picture of you in the Jewish Boy Scouts. How, are you, how, how old are you roughly in this picture? Well, we start maybe about 10 years old, then 12 to 14. And, and what does a Jewish Boy Scout do in Syria? We do, you have merit, do you have merit badges, Joe? Merit badges? I'm only kidding you. In America, all the Boy Scouts... And, they do little projects and they get merit badges. What did you do as part of the Jewish what Boy Scouts? What I did is to learn uh, to be a fighter and one day to go to Israel and uh, become a part of the, uh, the uh, creation of uh, Israel. Okay, this is very important to me. As a youngster, in essence, the Jewish community in Syria is grooming you to one day go to Palestine, and help fight in the establishment of the State of Israel. Am I correct? Uh, yes. We had uh, Shlichim, uh, like a, uh, my teacher for Hebrew in school, because I was going to a uh, French Jewish school, Lycée Francais. And uh, the teacher, we had a rabbi for uh, Hebrew Torah. And then we had a teacher that come from Israel, uh, was his name Yonah, that teach us how to write and read Hebrew. But actually his job was to give us the feeling of Zionism. And that's what uh, put on our heart, our kids at age 14, 15, 16, to be uh, like Zionists and want to go to Palestine to create uh, a to Jewish, fight for a Jewish the homeland. state. Can you tell me, do you remember, what was the, how did they do it, Joe? How do you take a 14-year-old Jewish boy in Syria and instill him enough Zionist passion that this boy will one day want to go to Palestine and fight for the Jewish state. What did they do? What did they say? How did they touch you? Well, because uh, every time we have any kind of uh, affair or anything that we do through the young people, we always end it by saying Hatikva. And when you say Hatikva, immediately your heart touch something that unbelievable. So uh, this way you are, uh, you say, Hatikva, one day I'm going to be in Israel. Call out Baleva Penima Nefesh Yehudi Sophia. That's very important, and that creates feeling. And uh, the teacher t teaching us, you know, we have to go and things like that. So we became uh, wanted to go, and that way uh, I decided one day I'm going to go. Now, was your household Zionist-oriented? Were your parents involved in the idea of creating a Jewish state? Uh, from Syria, uh, there used to be Turkish uh, Jewish that coming through Syria to go to Palestine. And we used to hide them in the shul, which was next to our house, and then take them to uh, a place where they can smuggle them. And my father, of course, very Zionist. Uh, but he wanted me to continue my education before I go anywhere. So when you told him one day, as you became 15 years old, I'm going now to Palestine, what was the reaction of your father and your mother? I really didn't tell him. I really? took money from his pocket, and I went, I bought a ticket to a bus to take me to Lebanon from there to be taken through the mountain to Palestine. But my brother went and told him, and he caught me by the bus station. After two times trying to go by on my own, he decided there is no way he can keep me. So he made arrangement for me to go with another group. And this way I went through the mountain in Lebanon to Palestine, to Russia Nikrav. From there, I had a sister, and I went to her in, in Tanya, Israel. I went to her for a year, and then I joined the, uh, the Palmach, Paliam. Okay. We should define for anybody who might not know 
what the Palmach is, and the Palmach was a division of the Haganah. But please explain to our viewers, what does it mean for you at 15 years old to arrive in Palestine and then join the Palmach? Who were they? Well, Palmach is Plukot Machat, which are the Haganah, uh, the commando for the Haganah. This was the elite the strike elite works strike of the Haganah. This was the elite strike force of the Haganah, and the Haganah was basically the um, the, umbrella. the army of the Jewish agency. Right. It was the military arm of the Jewish agency in Palestine prior to the establishment of the State of Israel, and of course the Haganah would morph into the Israeli army after the establishment of the State of Israel. But the Palmach was the elite strike force. Yes. So you knew what you were getting into. Yes. And Yigal alone was the head of the Palmach at the time. Yes. And his sort of right-hand man was Yitzchak Rabin. Rabin. But did you ever either meet or have any contact with either Alon or with uh, Rabin? Uh, no. Okay. And where were you stationed? What, what, what part I, of the country? Uh, I, I joined the Paliam, which is uh, in 1947. That's the naval, naval division, division of the Palmach. Which we were involved in bringing uh, ships from Europe with immigrant to, uh, that were uh, stuck in Europe in camps with uh, no nation accepted to take them. So we, we, most of them came from Italy. We bought old ships and we brought them to Palestine. But the British stopped us from, enter, stopped them, stopped us. They rammed the ships and they, uh, they killed a lot of uh, our people. And in the end they wind up in Cyprus. Okay, I want to make sure again, some people watching may not know the history in as much detail. It's after the war. This is before the war. No, I'm saying this is after World War II. Oh yeah, after World War II. After World War II, and now we have Jewish homeless refugees in Europe yes. who want to make their way to Palestine. Right. And there is a quota of the number of Jews that the British, who have the mandate in Palestine, will permit to enter into the country in large measure in deference to Arab demands. Correct. And what you were doing, as I understand it, is you were part of the Palmach divisions that helped smuggle or in some way enable Jews on these boats that were sailing from Europe to land in Palestine and hopefully you would take them and essence take the people off the boats and they would find their way into right. places to live and in Palestine. Palestine. And meanwhile, the British are out there doing everything they can to stop the boats from ever reaching the shores and people like you who would take them in. We should also say it's not only the Palmach who was involved in this, you were also, you also had the sister organization, the Irgun was also involved in Aliyah Bet, also trying to get as many Jews yes. into Palestine as possible. Yes. Am I correct? Yes. And do you remember at all, did you ever actually work with Irgun groups doing this? No, I did not work with them. Uh, the only thing I remember is that the main objection is, and the main uh, thing they wanted to terrorize the British. Who did? The Irgun. Yes, the Irgun. Yes, go ahead. And Stern and Irgun. Yes. They are the right wing. The Palmach is aim at the time is to bring 100,000 Jews to Palestine. Now, if the British allowed those 100,000 to enter Palestine, probably we would not have had today Israel. Because? Because that's all what we ask from them. But since they didn't allow anybody to enter with all those ships, they took them and put them in camps, back into concentration camps, in matter speaking. So in the end, the United Nations they, and the British with the Irgun killing soldiers, they realized they cannot stay any longer. The British realized yeah. they could not stay. That's right. It is fascinating to hear you describe this, incidentally. Are you in some way giving credit to the Irgun's fight against the British for being one, not the only thing, but one of the things that helped push the British out of Palestine and pave the way for the establishment of the State of Israel? Definitely. Okay. You know, you say definitely. There are many older members of the Haganah and Palmach, who after the saison are so angry at Begin and the, and the Irgun that they refuse to give any credit whatsoever to the efforts of the Irgun. No, I, uh, I don't think so. My feeling anyway, 
that the combination uh, of uh, the two parties helped create the state of Israel. Good for you. And you think most of the people you know feel as you do? Yes. That in essence, you respected the fact that there were various groups doing various things, all of which together helped create the state of Israel? Yes. Okay. So we come back to you. Here you are with the Palmach. And one of the things you're doing is trying to get as many Jewish refugees, Jewish refugees into Palestine, Palestine as possible. The irony you're saying is that because they couldn't, it created a problem that continued to develop, which led to the Irgun's work against the British, getting they they killed and of course they hung the soldiers, which was the, right the final my house. The what? Not too far away from my house. Really? They so, so happened. Oh, I, we I should, know. Do you know the story? Well, I was in Netanya at the time, uh, where they took two officers. Right. The the British took captured a number of Irgun soldiers right. and said they were going to hang them. Right. And Begin ordered, you will take British soldiers. I don't know if it's Begin or the Stern. Uh, it was not Stern. Not, not Stern. This is, the, I don't know. But the Stern Could gang be. was virtually over by then. Oh, yeah? So Begin says, we will take soldiers and we will trade them. But right. if you hang our soldiers, we will hang your soldiers. Correct. And the British did, in fact, hang the Israeli soldiers, the Israeli members of the Irgun. And Begin's at... Uh, Begin and the Haganah felt these were Israeli Jewish soldiers fighting for the War of Independence, including against, unfortunately, the British. And when, lo and behold, the British hung the Irgun members, Correct. Begin had the um, British soldiers, I think there was two of them. Two of them, uh, two happened to be, one of them was Jewish. That's correct. And they were hung, they were hung in a, in a, in a yeah. building, and then they were taken out to an orchard and left yeah, there to be found be. by the British. And you're saying that, lo and behold, this was near where you were living. Yeah, in Netanya. In Netanya. And obviously, as a 15, 16-year-old boy, you remember this very, very well. Not 100% uh, because I was not involved with the movement. Okay, fair enough. The uh, only thing I remember, that all over Netanya, they were the British soldiers with machine gun in every corner and searching, and anybody that went in and out was searched. And uh, I can tell you stories what the British did, searching for uh, arms and uh, Beta Levy, uh, you know, f far. Tell the story. Uh, we heard that the British, they're coming to search for arms and that kibbutz. So they uh, call everybody, the young people or whoever available to go there and just sit around without doing anything so that the British will not be able to go in with trucks and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and tanks. But when the British came in, we were only sitting on the ground without arms, without uh, nothing, with their bayonet. I have a friend who got uh, stabbed with a bayonet right in the stomach. Another friend got five bullets from stand gun, that three in the leg and two over here just because he was sitting and doing nothing. And they just wanted to go in, and uh, that's what the, how bad they were those days. You know, it's something hard for us to imagine. Most of us imagine the British in a very different way. But what you're saying is that during the War of Independence, or what, actually leading up to the War of Independence, the British were often very cruel. Very cruel. Did you have any personal contact with British soldiers that was ever upsetting to you? That's the, part, that's the one I'm talking about, that I was sitting also among those friends. And one of them is my friend. That and fortunately, you were not injured. No, not injured, no. OK. Um, do you remember how you felt about the British at the time? Uh, hate. I won't let the, the ships to come with immigrants then uh, terrorizing every Jew that uh, gone. we were afraid to, uh, to go places. We always tried to avoid the British, and they had uh, a police station in every intersection. So we, we tried to avoid them as much as possible. And come back one f for one moment to the issue of the Irgun versus the, the British. Because my understanding of the history is that the Jewish agency in the Haganah, and therefore the Palmach, had more to do fighting the Arab population. Right. And the Irgun was more involved in fighting the British. Right. Do you remember whether you at the time had a certain kind of respect for both Menachem Begin, 
who was known to be the leader, and what the Irgun was doing. And you know, as you sat by from a Palmach perspective, what was your attitude about Irgun actions vis-a-vis -vis the British? Uh, I guess I approved it. But uh, my group, we were in a different yes. frame of mind and different mission to do. But uh, any, uh, any action against uh, an enemy that can stab children, to me, it's okay. We have, by the way, some extraordinary pictures that you've brought us that show the boats that were bringing the Jewish refugees to the shores of Palestine. These boats are reminiscent of the Exodus, which of course became so famous in the movie starring Paul Newman yeah. as Ari ben Kanaan. Um, but you dealt with the real live people who were really orchestrating and organizing the attempt to save Jews. Only one ship. Only one ship. It's, it's the ship we see here in the picture? Uh, you or, or a ship see... like it? Um, you may be able to see a ship that has uh, like ropes coming down to the shore. I could be one of, not my, I cannot verify that's me, but I know that I was there. And uh, this is the ship that Naharia brought it down. That's amazing. Uh, that's amazing. And you also point out that if the British did intercept the ship, they often took all of the inhabitants to Cyprus, where they were interned there. But I, and I say this with all respect, Joe, I think it's a mistake to call them concentration camps. A concentration camp that the Nazis created had both a barbarism and a purpose to them, and sometimes they were death camps. None of those facets were true here. These were horrible detention camps, detention camps. which it was inappropriate to put a Jew from a concentration camp now into a detention camp. It was just a horror, but it still was a brutal thing that the British but did. But when a Jew cannot get out to go to any country or any place in the world was refused uh, uh, entry, not to England, not to America, not to France, not to Palestine. Uh, to me, it's almost another concentration camp. I understand. I mean, uh, yes, maybe they weren't killing them, but there is one ship, on the, we have it here, uh, that uh, it's called, th there is a flag on it, it's a Bevin, the successor of Hitler. There is... So Bevin, Bevin was, the prime, was the prime minister of England, so he was very, very bad. Bevin was the individual who really clo helped to close Palestine to any Jewish refugees after World War II. Right. Yes. And um, well, was he prime minister or foreign minister? I think he may have been I, foreign, minister. foreign minister. Yes, but he was one of the really hated individuals at the time because he was he was in essence pouring salt in a wound that was open, a gash. It was, it was just despicable what was done. And we have a picture here of the way the British soldiers are handling people who are the Jews who are coming off the boat. And you can see here there is no sense of empathy or sympathy, correct? No, no. Maybe the, the sol some soldiers did have uh, some feelings, but uh, not the majority of them. Mm -hmm. So, lo and behold, where are you on May 14th, 1948? Where are you? On May 14, 1948, I was in Bet Eshel, a kibbutz, the furthest kibbutz in the Negev, which I took convoys there, and then I got an order to stay there to defend it. Okay. Again, I want to remind everybody, here you are, you're in the Palmach, and one of the things that Palmach is now going to do as the War of Independence approaches is do what it can to protect Jewish communities. Correct. And you've been sent with how many other Palmach members to the Negev? We were seven. Only seven of Only you. Only seven. Because we were taking the convoy with food and supply, um, protecting it. As May 14th, the 5th of ER approaches, do you worry about whether the state is ever going to be declared? Are you, is there trepidation? Are you anxious? Are you exhilarated? Can you tell us something about what you're feeling just before Ben-Gurion announces the declaration of the state of Israel? Well, I was not in, an, in Israel that time. I was in a separate part of Israel 
which was in the Negev, which is that we didn't have actually uh, any information what's happening in the main land. Really? Hardly any information. You were cut off. Yeah. We had only uh, just, uh, what do you call it, uh, walkie-talkie, not walkie-talkie, you know, like uh, radio corresponding, uh -huh. one, one of them. Short wave of some kind? Sh yeah, short wave. That's the only thing we had in the place. And uh, Did you know war was coming? Well, I know that the 15th of May that we're going to be attacked by the Egyptian army, and we are going to be the first target of the Egyptian army. Okay, so what did... Joe Abudi feel, knowing that that was about to happen? I uh, built a good bunker, <laughs> and uh, so deep that in case a bomb comes down, I don't think would have hurt me. And we all uh, had a, like a kitchen underground. Everything, everyone has his own bunker just in case a bomb or uh, anything comes. Nobody will get hurt except one person. Is that we have some pictures here of you in the Negev, and it's also we have some pictures of you in the Palmach in general. We should remind everyone, it was not simply men who were fighting in the Palmach. It was men and women, was it not? Yes. Uh, and there are you know, these romantic type stories of young people, men and women, fighting together shoulder to shoulder, and even romantic stories about liaisons that occurred and people getting married in, in some lovely ways. You didn't know what the future was going to be like. No, many of my friends married uh, our fr uh, the girls that we were growing up with. Yes. Uh, so here we have it. You now know that there's going to be a war with the Egyptians, right. the Syrians, the Jordanians, the Iranians, Saudi Arabia. Everybody was going to come after the state of Israel. It doesn't sound to me like you were frightened. No, I wasn't frightened. I don't think we uh, we didn't even know. Uh, we were so excited that the, the 15th, we're getting the independence. Uh, we knew we were going to defend ourselves and without uh, hesitation. So uh, when the Egyptians arrived to Beersheba, they lined up their cannons and they start uh, shelling us. We went into our bunker. Unfortunately, our commander, uh, he was killed with that first uh, shell that came. Do you remember his name? I have the name. Uh, Doesn't matter. Okay, uh, go ahead. Moshe. But your commander, Moshe, your yeah. commander was the only one. Your commander the was only the one only one. At that time, yeah, that was killed right away then. And then? So uh, then the uh, Egyptian army lined up their cannons on the 15th of May. And uh, it was only a matter of three quarter of a mile distance. The kibbutz is only 40, 50 people in it, and we are seven. Then we got another six extra Palmach with us. So 13 Palmach members are supposed to defend this entire kibbutz. Yes, but the kibbutz themselves, the people, the children and women, they went out. They took them out before expecting the invasion, expecting the trouble is going to be. Where they put them? They took him to the main, uh, to another area. I don't know where. Okay. Because those are kibbutz people. So they evacuated the women and children. Yes. So now what you have in the kibbutz, but Eshel only men. 40, 50 kibbutznik, and 12 palmach. What weapons did you have? Uh, we had uh, one. Uh, we had actually the palmach. We had. Uh, Rifle from the British Army. The kibbutz. A rifle or rifles? Rifles, not one for. Did everyone have a rifle? I think we didn't have enough for all of us. And the kibbutz had. Uh, I was reading a book about Bet Eshel recently. They said that they had uh, a machine gun. Uh, um, I don't remember the name. The English. Machine gun. I have my. It picture wasn't the with Bren, was it? Bren, yeah. Yes. As a matter of fact, we had one. I have the picture with it. You had a Bren machine gun yeah. from the British. Yes, and we had two of them in the place, and that's about what uh, we had. And grenades. But they had tanks. Well, no. They, when they came in to uh, hit us first, they came with their cannon. They figured they will de destroy us and finish, but they didn't realize that we are. Uh, each one under a bunker, 
we have three barbed wire around the place and between there is booby traps in case we get invaded so when they put their cannon and start shelling us 10 palmach we took our uh, rifles and we uh, counted one two three shoot and we start shooting we the, you know when you shoot 10 guns at the same time the enemy doesn't know what kind of uh, power you have where it is so uh, after about five ten minutes the cannon went away and we didn't see any more egyptian hitting us anymore so uh, that night we go at night we meet in the desert a bedouin they give us information what's happening they told us that why you don't know what you did you killed the command of the egyptian army on their way to jerusalem wow and uh, you held them extra and they can't go right now because they need new command you killed the commander the command of the Egyptian Commanders. force Commanders. that was heading to take Jerusalem on their amazing. way to Jerusalem amazing 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 and then was that the only fighting you had to engage in well they kept on uh, shelling us all the time and uh, then I uh, was burying our commander my best friend was standing with digging the tomb a bullet came went through his shoulder came out from here I told him parrots uh, jump into the, the hole he said to me I can't move I said it's only a flesh wound he said but I can't move I bandaged him and then turned out to be that as we standing like that the bullet went through his spine and came out from his cheek he was uh, he, he became invalid all his life but he's still alive do you still have contact with him yes that's lovely where is he living Tel Aviv Tel Aviv yeah, I have a contact with all my friends. Really? All the time. It's so lovely that you've stayed together, you know? Um, and then, does it get quiet? Uh, just that uh, they kept uh, bombing us till I was there about uh, seven to eight months. And then they uh, became a ceasefire declaration by United Nation. And that time, I asked to get out of uh, Bet Eshel to get a vacation for a week. They gave me a week vacation. I went back to my unit in, uh, in, in uh, Bet Lid. And uh, then they told me, you can stay with them. And we went to training in the Kinneret torpedo boat that sunk the uh, Egyptian uh, King Farouk uh, ship, mm. Parva. So those uh, boats, the speedboat, which we loaded the front with uh, Hoven efforts, you know, uh, DTT, mm -hmm. not DTT, the, what are you going to TNT. Uh, TNT. And one person will ride it and go on full speed against the Egyptian ship, like a hundred yard or two, jump out of it and let it go to, that's our torpedo boat. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we destroy uh, Egyptian uh, ship. You know, the popular impression is that at the time of the War of Independence, the state of Israel, the infant state of Israel, was enormously outnumbered. And that it was the first of many miracles that the young Israeli soldiers, men and women, were able to hold off this vast Arab force. I'd like to know two things, Joe. To what extent do you feel that's an accurate depiction, or is it a romanticized depiction? And were you aware of this imbalance and that it would take a miracle to survive? Well, it is a miracle of miracle that after 2,000 years, about four to 5,000 kids were really able to stand up to all the armies around the Egyptian, the Syrian, the Jordanian, the Iraqis, to stand and fight them and be able to conquer them and gain land on top of it. So I, I really think it is uh, 
unbelievable, but we lost more, almost half our friends. Yes. Did you feel vastly outnumbered? 100%. By, by no, no, you, you cannot even imagine the difference between uh, the, uh, beside the Arab citizen of Palestine, you got all the armies of uh, the uh, surrounding around the Palestine of Israel. So but they came by the thousands. Then why weren't you frightened? When you're fighting, you're not frightened. You're not uh, afraid. You're just an uh, instinct. But it feels like you never doubted that somehow you would prevail. Oh, no, I never had a, 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 a... No, it never entered my mind that we will not have a state of Israel. Never entered that mind. Can you speak about that for one more moment? Because there's something almost unreasonable about that. And yet all of you had the same feeling, of course we're going to prevail. Where do you think that comes from, Joe? A feeling that you have no other choice but to stand. What we really had uh, to our advantage, that we know we have no choice but to fight. While the uh, Egyptian, the Syrian, they didn't know why they're coming to fight. And when they got killed by the hundreds, they start running away. They were not up to the challenge because they had no, uh, no, Yosma, uh, uh, no interest really. Uh, why, why are they there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, when they see their friends getting killed, when it started, first of all, uh, like I mentioned, the the barbed wire and the thing, the mobs they start coming to attack the, the kibbutz. We let them come into the barbed wire. Let them cut the first barbed wire. Let them think that they are they finished us. Till they come start the, on the booby trap again. Then we shot them and we went out and we took their guns and we used them too. Mm -hmm. This has uh, happened in many kibbutzim in the Negev. Mm -hmm. So. The story that uh, they, they, they had no reason for them, most, I mean, the foreign uh, armies to come and fight. And the Palestinians themselves, they were no fighters. They were not up to, to fight. They just terrorized the, the road, the convoys, the Jerusalem, you know, ambushed our foot, you know, th that's uh, about it. You said earlier you hated the British. Did you hate the Arabs? Uh, it is a question. Uh, I never really did hate the Arabs. But maybe today I do. But not then? No. How did you feel about them then? I feel they should have accepted the division and take their own land and we take our own land and uh, live in peace as neighbors. It wasn't in their mentality to do that. No, they thought they could, they're going to finish us, and we're going to beg the British to come back and defend us. But thank God we survived. At the time, the word Palestinian was not used very much. In your mind, did you make a distinction in 1948 between Arabs in general and Palestinian Arabs? The Palestinian Arabs, they, they were in Palestine. But the other Arabs, they, they really, I guess, I, there is. The, the Palestinian Arabs are Palestinian Arabs, not uh, foreign. But did you call them Palestinians at the time? No. You called them Arabs? Arabs. OK. And at what point do you start calling them Palestinians? Uh, Are we talking about now the 1960s? Uh, yeah, 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 way, way later. Yeah. Was it a mistake that we, the Jewish people, made not understanding there was a Palestinian people until the 1960s? It's very delicate questions. If it was the right thing to recognize them at all. You think it may have been a mistake to recognize them yeah. even now? In my opinion. Uh, when uh, they uh, recognize Arafat and they let him come from Tunisia to create a state, 
but I really don't know would have been great the greater Israel with uh, all the Arab uh, population multiplying you know their children and everything like that what would have happened to the state of Israel as a democracy this is uh, something uh, I guess nobody would know Joe you seem to think very highly of Menachem Begin yes do you think Menachem Begin was going to create a second army listen all I know is this, if he just turned the army, the arms to the army, this thing would never have happened. And he would have been still a leader without any questions. Yes. By the way, he has documents that indicate he had made that commitment and had a deal he thought with Ben Gurion himself. I don't know about those deals, okay, to be honest. Fair, fair enough. But that's how you experienced the Altalena affair at the time. That's, that's the is what I read affair. many books on both sides. Uh -huh. And that's what uh, my mind tell me, this is the right, so that will not be any fighting between uh, the two, between the army and another group. And we had, uh, we attacked different uh, Arab positions, uh, one side the Palmach, one side the Irgun, things didn't work out too good. I can't remember the date, so this may be an unfair question to ask you. Were you in Palestine when the King David Hotel was bombed? Yes. Do you remember any reaction to no, that? No, I was in the Negev because I was, I didn't hear about it till later. Okay. In retrospect. Actually, also when the Al Talana came, I was in the Negev. Yes. In retrospect, what's your reaction to the bombing of the King David? Anything that helped chasing the British out of Palestine? You were in favor, think. okay. Yeah. And um, do you have any reaction to Deir Yassin? Deir Yassin is an Arab village where the Arabs claimed, right. and the Haganah claimed also, that the Irgun had done a massacre of Arabs. Begin and the Irgun claim it was not that way at all, but what is for sure is that the Arabs became very afraid of the Israeli army in general, as a result of the legend of Dir Yassin. But what is your reaction to Dir Yassin? Well, uh, I don't know anybody that say it, it wasn't like this. All I, uh, I know, that, uh, what I learned from it is that it happened that way and they, everybody ran away because they afraid also Yafo, the same thing. They all uh, vacated and they ran away out of Yafo. So uh, what, uh, as far as I'm concerned, was a good thing that I think it's a good thing that what happened that uh, made the, uh, thousands of them uh, run away to different countries. Mm -hmm. In general, one of the things that's always discussed when we look back on early Israeli history is whether the Israelis forced Arabs to leave or whether the Arabs fled on their own. Do you have any sense here? No, I don't think we forced anybody to leave. The fact that we still have citizen, you know, a Arab citizen of the state of Israel. All those here that they, they did not leave, they became citizens of Israel. And if you ask them today, would you rather be under Palestinian law or under Israeli as a citizen of Israel, to tell you, what are you talking about? We are Israelis because we get all the benefit, we have the jobs, we got uh, health insurance, we have everything, we live like kings in comparison to the others. Another name, Mickey Marcus. Mm -hmm. Explain who Mickey Marcus was and what's your reaction to Mickey Marcus. Uh, all I can say about Mickey Marcus is uh, is a colonel of the from the United States who joined the Palmach to take the convoy to Jerusalem. But that's all I can tell you is that what I read because I wasn't there. So... Uh, Do you have any sense of how he is held in high regard, not high regard? Oh, very, very high regard. Oh my God, he became uh, very high regard. Yes. Mickey Marcus became the first general that David Ben-Gurion gave that rank yes. to. And here he was, an American Jew who had been a, um, 
an officer in the American Army. He came to Israel and brought a certain degree of expertise that was very, very helpful, not only, as you say, in breaking the blockade of Jerusalem, but and uh, building what became known as the Burma Road. Burma Road, right. But he also was a remarkable human being, and of course his death was a tragic accident. And it sure is. And he, you know, Moshe Dayan himself brought Mickey Marcus's body back to the United States as a great sign of reverence. And it would be wonderful, Joe, if all American, you know, children knew not only the names of Ben Gurion and Begin and Weizmann and Dayan and Rabin, but they also knew the name of Mickey Marcus. And one of the things that I fear, and I'd love to hear your reaction. One of the things that I fear is that the present young generation of American Jews look at 1948 <laughs> as ancient, ancient history. And that there's a less of a sense, even among 30 and 40 year old American Jews, of what it was before there was a state of Israel and what it was to have this momentous event that you helped shape the creation of the state of Israel. And yes, you know, television tends to glamorize war. There's nothing glamorous about war. It would be better if there was never ever a bullet fired at any other human being. But you were there and you made something happen that was momentous in Jewish life, momentous. The destruction of the temple in 586 and 70, and then the reestablishment of a modern Jewish state in 1948. And I fear that fewer and fewer American Jews appreciate, that's the right word, appreciate with full understanding of what contribution people like you made and what it means now to have a Jewish state and this state of Israel. Any comment? Yes. I am very much very active. I mean, and uh, bringing to my community the feeling and the knowledge of the, those days. I go and give uh, like uh, speeches and some yeshivas and yeshivot. And uh, on uh, one time I was in the, the museum in uh, Tel Aviv, which I helped also. The museum is the story about the War of Independence. And this is the Palmach Museum the Palmach in Tel Aviv. Yeah. So uh, I saw a book. The book is The Forgotten War. The name of the book, The Forgotten War. I gave it, I'm reading it, and I gave it to one of my son-in-laws to read. He's reading, oh, it's amazing. Did they do that? Did they do that? They really did that? You really did that? He was so amazed to read it. So I got very, I said, if so amazed, then I should have it in the schools. I took, uh, I, I find the publisher, I had him send me 20 books. I put it in one school. They asked me, they, they, this school is for little children. They asked me for 20 books. Then I gave them to a high school in our community. They say, oh, they read it. They said, we want to put it in the curriculum. And I got them 200 books. And this is all the story of 1948 independence war. And uh, every Yom Atzma'ut come this last week, we had a party like you never saw anything like that, like you think you are in Israel. Flags, uh, a friend of mine who uh, is involved with the, uh, this uh, school, Yeshiva, he tell me, Joe, you're going to be so proud of me about a month ago, three weeks ago. I said, what did you do, Sammy? He said, my son joined the Israeli army. He lived in uh, America. He said, really? I'm really proud of you. So uh, we're having the party uh, last week. It was on Sunday or Monday? What was it? it Sunday. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We were having, and they had candles, 12 uh, torches to light. And the announcer, he said, we have an Israeli soldier who came specially to be with us this evening. Who walked in? This young man, my friend's son, who joined the army only a month ago. And his father didn't even know that he's in the United States. How lovely. He was so shocked. 
and it was some evening unbelievable and everybody's heart pumping and the love of Israel is there. Joe Abudi, this has been such an honor for me. I mentioned that to you before we began and even more so now. I can't thank you first for joining us. Thank, thank you, you for you. that. Thank you for that. Thank you. And also I thank you on behalf of our entire audience. Everybody watching wants to say to you for all you've done to help make our world possible. Trying, trying to make uh, knowledge more. There is more people in our community, in our schools, that today know about the, the creation of the State of Israel than I would say 10 years ago. I agree with you. May you continue to do this to 120 and beyond, and may there be other times when you and I get to be together, not only on television, but off camera as well. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Mark. Joe Abudi, who at the age of 18 took part in Israel's War of Independence following the declaration of the State of Israel on May 14, 1948.